In this lecture, I want to ask two questions. The first is how do people understand other cultures from the media they consume? And second, what does it mean to speak of media consumption as an escape? To answer these questions, I want to look at how viewers in Egypt experienced two soap operas in the 1990s. The first of these was Oshin. Oshin is an asadora, a Japanese serialized morning television drama. In 297 15-minute episodes, Oshin tells the story of Oshin Tanakura from 1907 up to the early 1980s. It originally aired on the Japanese television station NHK from April 4, 1983 to March 31, 1984. Oshin is the story of a woman born into a poor village in 1900. It describes her life and hardships from the time she is sold into domestic service by her father to the rise of her family into wealth and success as department store owners in the 1980s. Oshin experiences a series of advances and setbacks. Poverty, hunger, the grinding drudgery of agricultural labor, miscarriage, social alienation, marriage and separation, while persevering in hard work and nurturing children, husband, family and friends. Oshin became one of the most watched television serials in Japanese history, capturing nearly 70% of the entire viewing audience. Why? Anthropologist Ann Allison suggested that Oshin represented a new kind of female role model, tough and successful with traditional feminine values. Another popular reason is its portrayal of Japanese history. Oshin aired not on a commercial network, but on NHK, Japanese Public Broadcasting. The public support was justified by its educational value. For example, it offered an authentic portrayal of the Meiji period drawn from real biographical materials. In fact, Oshin covers 70 years of Japanese history. It begins during the Meiji period, which ran from 1868 to 1912. This period saw the establishment of the Japanese Empire, which required radical reform of state structure, currency reform, and the beginning of Japan's Industrial Revolution. Oshin lived into the Taisho period, which ran from 1912 to 1926. This was a period of Japanese expansion into China. Japanese experienced the democratization of the legislature. It was a period of extraordinary economic growth, going from rice riots in 1912 to unprecedented prosperity by 1926, and it was a time of increasing internationalism and it was memorable for the great Kanto earthquake which devastated Tokyo. Oshin also lives into the Showa period, from 1926 to 1989. This period includes World War II, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the occupation of Japan by the U.S., the demilitarization of the Japanese Empire and loss of its territories, the Americanization of Japanese social, political, and economic institutions, and rising economic prosperity. According to some media scholars, Oshin became a reference point for parents and grandparents to talk with children about their own suffering during Japan's turbulent modern history. But in spite of the fact that Oshin was so deeply rooted in Japanese history, the soap opera was seen not only in Japan, but in 58 different countries. How was Oshin understood in these other societies? Let's look at the case of Egypt. Oshin was aired in Egypt from 1992 to 1993 as a musalsala, or serial drama. It was dubbed into Arabic and made available for free by the Japan Foundation, which seeks to enhance Japan's reputation abroad. It was not, however, initially well received. It aired in the slot previously occupied by the popular U.S. soap opera The Bold and the Beautiful, and many Egyptians were initially outraged by the change. Kanaka Inouye was a Japanese student at the American University in Cairo who set out to research Egyptian responses to Oshin in Egypt. One Egyptian viewer told her, We enjoy the beautiful women and Western fashions in The Bold and Beautiful. While we're watching television, we want to forget about the poverty and problems that we have. At the same time, Egyptians identified with Oshin's problems and suffering. One viewer told Kanaka, I didn't feel that the problems Oshin faced were different from ours. For example, Oshin started to work as a nanny in a rich merchant family from her early age in order to financially support her family. Such a story is common in peasant families in Egypt. Viewers also said they sympathized with issues of patriarchy with which Oshin dealt. Unfairness toward women and the conflict between Oshin and her mother-in-law are issues we can easily find in Egypt, and we can relate ourselves to her situation, said one viewer. The program grew rapidly in popularity. Viewers told Kanaka that they appreciated the values of hard work and perseverance that Oshin represented. Taban, Oshin Helwa Awi. 
What I liked best was that she was so strong and never gave up, always tried to achieve the better life. I'm different from Oshin because I never married, but I can sympathize with her very much because I've been working for my family for a long time. Egyptians also liked Oshin's character. She represented a set of feminine characteristics that many Egyptians admired, strong and persevering, but humble and faithful. One viewer told Kanaka, I want to marry a Japanese woman. Did you see Oshin? Japanese women are so faithful. As in Japan, Oshin was a family viewing experience, as viewers related Oshin's family issues, economic problems, and moral dilemmas to their own lives. As an official at the Japanese Cultural Center in Egypt said, Ten minutes after Oshin finishes, a daughter will call her mother to discuss the program, and soon they start to discuss her family problems. Officials at the Japanese Cultural Center in Egypt said that the popularity of Oshin had several positive social outcomes. It created strong positive feelings towards Japan, it presented Japanese character in a positive light, and it generated considerable Egyptian interest in Japan. But the Cultural Center officials felt Oshin also created some distorted views of contemporary Japan, they said that viewers misunderstood contemporary Japanese gender roles, thought that Japan's economic conditions were much more precarious than they are currently, and generally confused past and present. Many Egyptians seem to believe Oshin was a depiction of modern Japan. They have a wrong image of us. For example, today Japanese women have more freedom than in the period of Oshin. One of the most interesting thing about Kanaka's interviews, however, was that at some point, Many people needed to explain Oshin by reference to the show it preempted, and which returned to replace it when it ended. The Bold and the Beautiful The Bold and the Beautiful is a U.S. soap opera about the wealthy Forrester family, whose business dominates the world of high fashion. Premiering in 1987, The Bold and the Beautiful continues in production to this day, even as many other U.S. soap operas were shut down because of dwindling viewership. Unlike the high-context Oshin, with its close attention to historical, economic, and political changes, the bold and the beautiful was low-context, meaning that there are few references to wider political and economic issues. The bold and the beautiful airs in more than 80 countries, leading to it being called the world's most popular soap opera. The bold and the beautiful aired in Egypt beginning in 1991. It aired on Channel 2, one of the national government channels. In interviews, Egyptians emphasized that they loved the beauty of the show, including the beauty of the actresses, the lavishness of the settings, the fashionable and expensive clothing, and the high production values. But the viewers also emphasized that they admired the boldness of the show. They enjoyed the naughtiness of the immoral activities characters engaged in, expressed fascination of the aspirations for wealth and power that characters aspire to, and they fantasized about the unattainable commodities possessed by the wealthy foresters and the people they interact with. Ultimately, Egyptians enjoyed both Oshin and The Bold and the Beautiful, yet in very different ways. How do we analyze this? One way is to think about what's happening when people imaginatively escape into the fictional worlds of Oshin and The Bold and the Beautiful as social acts. A method for this was explored by Janice Radway in her 1984 book, Reading the Romance. In Radway's model, there are three key questions to be asked. First, into what kind of world are media consumers escaping? That is, what is the narrative world of the books or soap operas or games into which people imaginatively enter as they read or view or play? Second, what kind of life are media consumers escaping from? That is, what is the everyday world in which they live, and why do they want to imaginatively escape it? Third, how does the particular media people consume shape the ways they escape? That is, how do acts of reading, watching television, or playing games create different kinds of avenues of escape? But perhaps the most important element of Radway's model for analyzing escape as a social activity is her insistence that these three domains are all related to one another. Radway's book offers an exemplary model for this kind of analysis. Interviewing 44 women who were members of a romance book club in an American city, she found that they used romance reading as a way of resisting domestic systems of power. As texts, romance novels offer narratives in which intelligent, independent women overcome a series of emotional and physical obstacles to win the love of a man who has likewise been transformed during the course of the novel into someone who can care for and nurture her. Most of the women interviewed by Radway were escaping into this world from an everyday domestic reality in which they are called upon to selflessly care and nurture for others. 
But this is not just a virtual imaginative escape. It is an actual pragmatic social action that provides women with an escape from the constant activities of domestic labor. Because husband and children are told, this is my time, my space, now leave me alone, they're expected to respect the signal of the book and avoid interrupting. Book reading allows the woman to free herself from her duties and responsibilities and provides a space or time within which she can attend to her own interests and needs. This is facilitated by the fact that in mainstream American culture, book reading is understood as a private activity and one that's more serious and growthful than watching television or playing games. The same questions can be asked and answered about the watching of Oshin in Egypt. Oshin offered a narrative world in which a young woman beset with problems stoically endures for decades, suffering, persevering, and overcoming obstacles created by family tensions, economic downturns, political unrest, and more, without ever losing her humility, quiet strength, and faithfulness to family. The viewers who escaped into this world often felt themselves confronted by the same kinds of problems that beset Oshin, a life of consecutive obstacles that they must overcome, only to be faced with new ones. The medium of television in Egypt is a collective medium. People watched as families, or they watched separately and connected with one another following the show. As a result, talking about Oshin became a way of reflecting on their own problems, reflecting on the ways in which they faced them, and on the virtues they exhibited along the way. That people interviewed about Oshin continually brought up the bold and the beautiful, though, reflects their own recognition that these two Musalso could not be more different. The narrative world of the bold and the beautiful offers a drama about people whose lives are insulated by wealth and power from the kinds of everyday obstacles that face most Egyptian viewers, and who occupy a world of material wealth most Egyptians can only fantasize about, and yet who face continued emotional struggles and interpersonal conflicts. It is an imaginative escape from the economic, social, and political struggles that face most Egyptians in their everyday lives. Like Oshin, the television series invites family discourse, but here the talk centers around the program as a cautionary tale. Wealth does not bring happiness, nor does it beget virtue, if anything, quite the opposite. Egyptian viewers can thus enjoy the spectacle of wealth and luxury while reflecting on the fact that at least their own lives are more virtuous and honorable by contrast. And what about Pokémon? What kind of narrative world does Pokémon offer? Who escapes into this narrative world? And from what kinds of everyday lives do they escape? And how do they escape? Is watching the Pokémon television series a different kind of escape than playing Pokémon on a Game Boy or collecting the cards? What do you think? Kanako never published her research, but here are a few references for more information on Oshin and on concepts discussed in this lecture. You can also find them in the course module.